Hey, beloved saints, I'm going to address an issue I've seen a lot of lately, and it is the, for one, I think they're getting it from a wrong interpretation or misunderstanding of the Hebrews 10, 26 verse, for if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, which clearly in the context of the entire chapter, it even starts with the law having a shadow of good things to come, could never take away sins, right? Uh, the whole thing is that if you hear the gospel and you reject the blood atonement of Jesus, that's a willful sin against God. You're trampling the son of God underfoot, right? Uh, there is no more sacrifice for, there remains no more because the temple system's dead. You can't, there are no more animal sacrifices. Jesus is the only and final sacrifice. So there remains no other sacrifice. He put an end to those. Um, they were all shadows, right? So for some reason, people think all of a sudden after an entire chapter of them saying, don't trust the law, all the temple system, Levitical temple system was all shadows of Christ. This is what it was pointing to. Now, all of a sudden they're going to talk about, uh, if you commit a sin on purpose, like you there's no more sacrifice for your sins. You send it all away. Like there's no power in the blood of Jesus. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So I thought, what do we have to do here? First of all, we have to see that without the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So, without blood, sin isn't forgiven or wiped out. So, <laughs> a lot of people try to say it's their past sins. Again, past from when? The sins that are past, that were paid for, were before the cross. Because the blood and bulls and goats didn't didn't purge their sin. It just covered them until the real sacrifice came. Jesus. That's why Old Testament saints are part of the body of Christ. You can see it in Ephesians 2 where it says the foundation is Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Then the apostles and prophets, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, both of Israel and other nations, all together, one new man in Christ. Right? So we need to see that uh, the sin, we're going to look at the old covenant blood sacrifices because if jesus is the new and better way and he died once for all perfected us forever except for sin on purpose if you sin on purpose i mean wh what a weak savior they think we have most sin is intentional however there are sacrifices in the old testament for sins you don't know you commit you could do them in ignorance and just in case you do a sacrifice that says, I may have sinned and didn't know I was sinning. Like there were certain laws about eating from trees that have to be a certain amount of years old and have borne fruit or didn't bear fruit or something. So sometimes they would unintentionally do things that offended God. Even the thought of foolishness is sin. Remember? Lots of things that we do, we don't even realize fall short of the glory of God. That's why all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And if people really understood the true standard of the law, just because we don't meet God's standard of perfection doesn't mean we're saying, well, you can't meet it, so you might as well just do whatever you want and be wicked. That's never been what we said. We tell you, don't trust in your ability to keep God's law. Because if anyone you're guilty of all, you've already broken it. You can never earn it. It says, if there had been a law that could have given life, Verily, righteousness would have been by the law. But because of the infirmity of our flesh, it wasn't. So we're going to look and see, were there sacrifices in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant? And by the way, those words can be used as different words. But in this case, they're used as the same. They're synonyms. Okay? Testament and Covenant in these verses are interchangeable in this case. Okay? Because there's a lot of people dividing that and saying, no, it's the old is a covenant. The new is a testament. It's a, uh, it's just, I don't know. Anyway, it's, conf it's confusing people. So I'm going to show you testament and covenant are used for both new and old in the book of Hebrews. You can, you can see that. So I don't want anybody to get tripped up on it because I know that there's uh, some people doing that and it causes some confusion. Let me um, see here. If you go over, because if the Old Testament has specific sacrifices for intentional sin, then wouldn't Jesus's 
because it was a shadow of the good things to come. Now, it's just ridiculous to say that Jesus, his blood, doesn't pay for sin we commit on purpose. Most sin is on purpose. We hear that voice going, ooh, don't do that. Don't lie. Do it anyway. Don't steal. Do it anyway. Don't commit adultery. Do it anyway. It's not usually accidental or not not knowing, you know. Um, but there were sacrifices made for both. So I'm going to show you if without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Everybody's lost. Because the only reason anybody has eternal life is because their sin debt paid. The wages of sin is death. Jesus paid that wage for us because the life is in the blood, right? Well, eternal life is in his. So let's look at Leviticus. I think it's six. I don't want this to be too long, but I want to address this because this is terrible. It's like, oh, okay. So if you sin on purpose, then you're just, you, well, forget it. Once lost, always lost. Just no understanding of the victory we have in Christ. No understanding of how precious our Lord's blood was. Do they realize that he's pre-existing God himself? God manifested in the flesh. And, and lived as a human. Entered his creation. Became the son of God. In, in sinless body. But lived as a man. Tempted in every way as we are. Lived a perfect life. And died that horrible death for us. As if that wasn't enough. I don't understand it. Why they they belittle him like that. And, and I love the wording in Hebrews 10. That says. Trample the son of God underfoot. Called the blood of the covenant. By which you were sanctified. Or made holy. By which you were sanctified. An unholy thing. Despite the spirit of grace. What an insult to him. So let's go over to. Um, Leviticus 6. We're just going to look at this real quick. You can read, you know, the whole, the whole section if you want, but I just want to give you an idea here. Here's intentional sin. They were called trespass or guilt offerings, right? Um, there's atonement. There's sin offerings. Um, some of these were for unintentional sins or sins done in ignorance. But guess what? Still on your account. So if you're a person that believes if you sin on purpose or if you sin at all, uh, you, you won't, you, you'll lose your salvation. What happens if you don't know you sin? Cause we do that all the time to know good and do it. Not the apathy we feel towards others. Suffering is sinful. People just don't realize how much we've fallen short and what a great gift God gave us. And what an insult it is to trust us instead of trust him. You're literally calling God a liar. And say, no, we didn't get eternal life because that would mean you could do this and do that. Not without consequence. But that's God's love for us. We're adopted into his family. And our, our walk gets better once we are secure. Because if you have an identity crisis, I don't know if he's really my father or not. How can you live the way you're supposed to? If you don't know who you are. I mean, it's just terrible, like religious spirit as opposed to the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father like we're supposed to right so many people hate the message of the gospel you got pastors out there arming people against getting born again they're arming them against the true gospel telling people it's easy believism uh easy or hard you're saved by grace through faith not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can make fun of it, but why would you? You believe God, and he counts it to you for righteousness, or you don't believe God. And in that case, you're lost. So why are you saying anything? So let's see. Yeah, I know I get, uh, this is the one thing I'm willing to fight for, the gospel. There's too many people suffering. There's too many saved people getting confused. But there's too many people suffering. And this is the most glorious news and what an insult. And I've dedicated but what I have of my life to, to this message, the truth of the gospel. Because I know I see people suffering all the time. All the time. Because they're honest with themselves. 
people that, that think they're living without sin at all. I didn't sin today. Uh, you just did. They're blind to their own sin. And we, we all sin in thought, word, and deed. So the Lord spake unto Moses, if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep or in fellowship or in a thing taken away by violence or has deceived his neighbor or have found that which was lost and lieth concerning it and sweareth falsely in any or all of these things that a man doeth sinning therein, then it shall be because he sinned and is guilty that he shall restore that which he took violently away. So you literally go up a guy and bop him upside the head and steal his wallet or whatever, his, his bag of chain, coins, and run off. That's pretty intentional. I'd say that's intentional. Or your neighbor lost uh, some sheep. You found him and said, no, man, I ain't seen him. Bah, I ain't seen him. <clears throat> I don't know what you're talking about. You do that, that is clearly intentional, right? So these are intentional sins. They are uh, guilt. These are guilt offerings, trespass offerings. It says, or all, or all that about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore. He shall bring a trespass offering unto the Lord. It's always a male ram without blemish. Uh, I, I love the pictures of the sacrifices and how they point to Jesus, uh, Jesus like even with the hyssop. And um, oh, it's just, I don't want to get into it because I'm going to, I'm going to go off on a tangent, but it's just beautiful how, how it's confirmed in Jesus, which by the way, we're going to see here, we're going to go over to Hebrews and see how that all that was a shadow. It's clearly a shadow. So you see right here, the Old Testament offerings were for intentional as well as unintentional sin, as well as ignorance, just not knowing that you did it. Maybe I did something wrong. I have no idea, but just in case I make this offering, right? So why would you think Jesus's blood doesn't cover intentional sin? I mean, it even goes on to talk about if you lie with your, uh, in adultery, would you trip, fall in the bed? I mean, of course it's on purpose. I, uh, I don't get that. I've heard quite a few people claim that in the old Testament, they didn't have any willful sin, uh, blood. Or yes, they do clearly trespass and, and guilt offerings so you can see that uh you can see all kind you, if you want to study that it's pretty amazing i mean it can get boring because it's like it seems repetitive and tedious but it, if you can see it in a new light you can see little pictures in it and it's it's beautiful it really is so let me uh go over here i'm gonna i'm gonna just give you a rundown from hebrews chapter 6 to 10 few verses here and there, not all of them, but some key points. If you go over to Hebrews 6, uh, you'll see uh, in chapter 17, it says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immutability. And what, and what does Paul say? That we're heirs according to the promise, because Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Not seeds, as in many, but thy seed, which is Christ, right? So the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. He is the seed, right? So all the promises are yea and amen in him. And so the heirs of promise are all who are in him. Israel, believing people of Israel, and then it opened up for all the rest of the nations. All of us together in Christ. Jesus said, I have one fold, one shepherd. I have sheep not of this fold. He's going to bring them in. It's going to be one fold, one building, one tree. You see? So we're all heirs of the promise. I want you to see that. So it says the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Because when God promises something, it's done. And he promised eternal life if you simply trusted in Christ your Savior. Do you understand He's Savior. He saves. Not with your help. Not with your cooperation. He saved us. He asked you to believe it so you can receive it. So you believe the message. You believe what Jesus said. You believe what he did. You believe what God promised. You receive that and you become a child of God. Then worry about how you live and all that. Because that's a whole separate issue. Nothing to do with salvation. Nothing. 
and you can use all the straw man arguments you want, but God keeps you safe for his name's sake. I was reading all through Isaiah last night. I can't tell you over and over again, eternal security, eternal security, eternal security. I, I, I save them for my name. I keep them. I redeem them for my name's sake. It's all in the scriptures. See, he doesn't keep you because you're faithful. He keeps you because God cannot lie. And he does it for his own glory and his own namesake. So stop thinking it's about something you earned or deserve. Nobody earns or deserves it. Nobody. It says, so he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now, this is the book of Hebrews, but all the promises were heirs of the promise. There's people teaching differently. Sorry, I'm not going to argue that argument right now, but if you don't know, you do have these promises, okay? So, because uh, it says, you Gentiles were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel and its covenants and promises, but now you've been brought in. So, uh, we want to lay hold. So, why is this word, these words used? The, these strong words. Well, you need to know God can't lie. He swore it. He didn't have to because he doesn't lie anyway. But he wants you to grab hold of it. This hope set before us. Hope, again, in the Bible is not like, ooh, wishful thinking. It's something God says you will have. It's a done deal, and you're looking forward to it. It's already yours. You're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what hope is in, in, in the Bible. It's, he said it, it's done. It's mine. All right? So that is what keeps us in joy and peace and gratitude. If you're serving God, and it's not out of gratitude and love, and you're living the way God says is pleasing to him, walking by faith, by the strength uh, that the Holy Spirit gives you, that is what you're supposed to do. But if you're doing it, and you're, you're doing it out of fear or trying to earn something, or hoping that you don't lose salvation, you're doing it for the wrong reason, because you cannot do anything to save yourself and you, you need to believe the gospel. You need to believe on Jesus. Believe on him. Believing on him doesn't just mean you believe he died for your sins, but he didn't accomplish anything with it. He died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day, meaning your, his blood was accepted on your behalf. How do we know that? Because he rose again. Paul said, if Christ be not risen, we are yet in our sins. But he did rise. We're not in our sins. They're not being held against us. So, and, and of course, it doesn't mean we're saying sin more because the sin isn't held against you in eternity. There's still consequence here on earth. And why would you want to do that? I, I don't understand this whole thing. Um, that was the last thing on my mind was I'm secure. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing gift. I can have peace in my spirit. And I wanted to tell everybody, and I wanted to read his word, because I'm like, the words didn't condemn me anymore. I, I can learn what is makes him happy. I can learn what he says about me. I was excited by him. I, I wasn't like, oh, thank goodness, I can just do all the wicked, horrible things I want to do. I wasn't even thinking that. Why do people go there? All right, so by two immutable things. So he swore so you could grab hold of that and have hope. It says right here, immutability of his counsel, so that you could lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul that weights it down, weights it down, both sure and steadfast. This is a promise that's certain, okay? And which entereth into that within the veil. The veil was the thing that, that separated uh, the high priest and the other areas from the holy of holies, where God's presence was. Where only the high priest went once a year. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which means a uh, righteous king or king of righteousness. So you, you can see God 
want you to know this was done and you have that promise now now i i put a couple of verses from seven not too many about uh the blood thing i wanted you to see these were all shadows but also what they meant here so we've got um let me see hebrews seven All right, and here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithe paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise to, uh, rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. See, the, the order of Aaron was the Levitical, the Levi priesthood, right? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which, as Judah, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evidence that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And yet it is far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Um, and then you see, the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by by the which we draw nigh unto god or close to god and inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest for those priests were made without an oath but this with an oath by him that said unto him the lord swear and will not repent thou art a priest forever after the order of melchizedek by so much was jesus made a surety of a better testament See, Testament and Covenant are both interchangeable in the book of Hebrews. You'll see that because it starts talking about the Old Testament and Old Covenants. It's, it can be two different words, but in this case, it's not. It's just a, um, a synonym. Uh, now, this says, I want you to see this part. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And it tells us uh, over and over again how those priests had to make an offering for themselves because they were sinners and then everybody else. Because it says right here, for such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Do you see that? So the Old Testament had, uh, or the Old Covenant, whichever you want to use, had the uh, blood sacrifice for intentional, willful sin. Okay? This one says, yeah, it had it, but they had to make them year by year continually. You had to make a separate one over and over again. But Jesus, one time for all. Okay, I don't know why they're trying to, they always limit the blood of Jesus. Like it's just not enough. So it says, as those high priests who offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. See, he had no sin. He didn't need to make one for himself. And it says, for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, or that means spot or blemish sin in their body. Remember, God sees us as an infirmity of our flesh, weakness in our flesh. That's why Jesus saved us, not to condemn us, but because we were born, we inherited this sin. Sin is not just an action. I, I reminded everybody earlier today on CES that, you know, like something Ralph Yankee Arnold said, he said, everybody's trying to take the sin off the through the behavior, right? But the body is still sin. They're never born again. They're just trying to live the best they can, thinking they're living a Christian life and they're not sinning or whatever. But it's still sin. See, it's a condition. 
not just a behavior, but a condition we were born with. And he said, no matter how many apples you take off the apple tree, it's an apple tree. It's still an apple tree. And this is still corruptible flesh, sinful flesh. So that's just the wrong way to go. You've got to be born again. This flesh has to die. It even talks about, you know, how a seed has to go in the ground so something else can uh, grow from it. So it says, those priests had an infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, make it the son, capital S, who is consecrated forevermore. So you can see he did it once. One time was enough. And yes, the old covenant did have intentional sin. What was the point of having a blood atonement to atone for the sin if it was only for accidental sin? That's just ridiculous. It's a condition we have. And we shouldn't give into it just because it's a condition. But God knew what we were up against. All right. So let me, there was only one or two things in um, eight I wanted you to see that in chapter eight, verse five, it says that these things are a shadow. Remember, I said the same thing in uh, Hebrews six and Hebrews 10, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. See, the tabernacle is kind of a, a almost like a, a replica of what's in the heavenlies. It's not a perfect replica, but it's it's to represent what's in the heavenlies, right? When Jesus offered his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, the Ark of the Covenant had a mercy seat with two cherubim over it, right? So, and that God's presence was in the middle. And by the way, that picture is fulfilled in the tomb of Jesus. An angel at the head, an angel at the foot. Jesus's body, God's manifest presence between them. It's also the Ark of the Covenant. All that is pictures of Jesus. Oh, man, I just get chills because oh, it's the greatest news ever. And it breaks my heart that people are saying he didn't accomplish. He didn't save us. And it says, um, thou make, it says, see that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises for if that first covenant see testament and covenant are used interchangeably had been faultless then should no place have been sought for the second for finding fault with them he saith behold the day will come saith the lord when i will make a new covenant and it's with the house of judah and with the house of israel people get hung up on that israel judah thing because they're thinking in terms of like the nation but he was dealing with people through genealogy until Jesus came, because it was to fulfill the promises to the fathers, to have them be keepers of the oracles of God. He was, they were a called out nation for these things and for the Savior of the world to be born through. Uh, it wasn't called out people just to be saved. The rest of the world, it was then open for them. So Israel and every other nation now comes to God through Jesus, that we're all reconciled to God through him, and it says in one body. So um, don't let Israel and Judah trip you up in regards to salvation issues like this, um, because God's people are believers, no matter what nation they're from, and we are one new man in Christ. So it says, um, let's see. And that he saith, the new covenant he has made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So we can see new and everlasting covenant. It's the same thing. They're not two. I think I've heard people say that they're two different covenants or something. I don't know. I don't know. I think Darby taught something like that. I know he taught that we weren't under the new covenant, but he just didn't understand Ephesians 2, I guess. I, I don't know. If you if you think that, that's that's fine. I'm not... Uh, I mean, you can disagree with me on it. You're still my brother or sister in Christ. Um, but I have to teach what I see clearly in scripture. So I'm sorry if we disagree on it. Hopefully you can still see the beauty of this having, um, uh, intentional sin being taken care of as well. This is very important. Um, 
See, it says, then verily the first covenant house of ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So, uh, Jesus divine himself is our high priest. Um, and we can see that in the tabernacle first made in uh, here on earth. But it's a picture. And that's what I was going to show you. I don't want to read it all because it's basically saying the same thing. Um, about the Ark of the Covenant and what the Holy of Holies look like and the veil and the cherubim. So if you go over to, I think it's Hebrews 8 and read the first half of the chapter, it'll explain all of the um, things that were made uh, and how they were pictures of the heavenly uh, sanctuary. And in Hebrews 7, it says the law made nothing Perfect. I may have actually passed that, but if you go Hebrews 7, I think 25 to, no, actually, probably 719 to 727 to 28, uh, it talks about how the law didn't make anything perfect. And we're going to go over to Hebrews 10 and see the same thing here, where the law was just a shadow. If the law was a shadow and that covered intentional sin, why would the great thing to come not cover them? Um, for the law, hey, this is Hebrews 10, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Do you see that? Perfect. And if you go over to Hebrews 9, it was worded another way. It says, um, would he not have offered it? it? Let me see. With one once his own sacrifice, he put away sin. I'll go back to nine if you want to see it. But this is the law could never take away sin. It says, could never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereon too perfect. For would then they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. If it wiped it out forever, they wouldn't feel guilty the year later and have to do another sacrifice, right? But it tells you, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Why are we having remembrance of sin all the time? He died once for all, perfected for Quit focusing on sin and focus on the sun. Sun consciousness, not sin consciousness. You're you're losing when you do that. Don't you know you complete in Christ? He did it all. Can't you not just love him and let him lead you knowing that he saved you? If you had that peace and that joy, nobody would have to tell you anything. You would just love him and want to do what he, that pleases him. But how can you serve him out of love and gratitude? Gratitude for what? You don't even know if he saved you. All right, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. It was an atonement. It, it temporarily covered it so they could have a relationship with God until the sacrifice came, Jesus. So those under the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the cross. And although they didn't know who he was, these sacrifices pointed to him. That's why when Jesus rose, you'll see Old Testament saints risen from the grave, walking around Jerusalem. They are also part of the body of Christ. Now, I know the dispensational teaching says otherwise, but nobody was saved by the law. It's not possible. They were saved by Jesus also. Peter says the sins that were passed before the cross. There's pictures of the cross all over the Old Testament. The wood making the bitter waters of Mara, which means bitter, sweet. That's the cross. It's all over the place. The red cord, Rahab, the blood of Christ. It, it all points to Jesus and they're part of it too. That's why Ephesians says, Jesus being the foundation chief cornerstone, also with a foundation of the prophets and apostles, all from the nation of Israel, as well as the other saints and all other nations. So Israel as a nation and the rest of the nations joined together with the apostles, the prophets, Jesus. It's it's right there. So I just want you to know your promises. And, and 
that this is all yours. It's done. If, if this isn't yours, then you don't have an intercessor. You don't have a mediator. You don't have anything. Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant. It's the blood that purges sins. And if it doesn't get rid of intentional sin, then you're lost and so am I and so is everyone. So it's just another way they're trying to say, you know, he didn't do it all. So it says, um, it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. And it's quoting here the um, Old Testament prophets. And I want to see where it says, uh, by the which will, this is the offering of his body, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after he has said before, and it goes into the quoting Isaiah, uh, or it may have been Joel, I can't remember. But it says, and having, hold on, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's why it's discussing what the Holy of Holies looked like and how the temple was laid out by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say his flesh. That's why the veil ripped from top to bottom. Uh, you could enter boldly to the throne of grace and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Do you see when you still have that conscience of sin, like it's still on your account, it is called an evil conscience because it means you're not trusting the blood of Christ. You're not trusting that he purged your sins. And that it was complete and that he got full victory. You're belittling his blood is, is not enough. Uh, it says, and all right, so having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. If God promised you eternal life, because Jesus died once for all and perfected us forever. Why are you walking around like you still got sin on your account that has to be done? And in this case, he was saying, hey, Hebrew people, why are you walking around acting like you still got to do year by year continual temple sacrifices when all that did was point to Jesus who did it all. It's done. You know, now uh, how, he says, let us not lay again the foundation of repent from dead works and a faith towards God. Stop with the dead Levitical temple works, the system. It's dead. It doesn't accomplish anything. So we should purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Stop thinking these things are necessary and understand the victory uh, Jesus got for us. So you guys, I want to show you, yeah, the sacrifice was clearly for intentional or willful sin, just like it was for unintentional um, sin. Uh, this doesn't mean we're encouraging people to sin. I don't know where this comes from, but St. Paul dealt with that, you know, and he said, you know, present your bodies a living, uh, living sacrifice. It's your reasonable service. Now, would it be your reasonable service if you weren't sure if you're saved? No, but it is if you, you he promised you eternal life. It's the least we could do, right? Live for the one that gave his life for us? Yeah. Then that makes sense, right? Walking in joy and the peace that surpasses all understanding. How can you have that? How can you have it? It's still based on you. Still, salvation is still based on you. If you're worried about it all the time, you're basing it on you. And, I, and there's so many uh, false teachers corrupting the gospel, condemning those of us that preach the real gospel. We're human. We're subject to error. We're all still growing and learning. But the gospel is something we cannot be wrong on. You're not saved. It, it, it's one doctrine that's so clear in scripture. But because it's so clear, so many people have had to add to it somehow by twisting other things up. Well, it's not faith. It's faithfulness. 
it's like anything to make it, you know, sound right without saying overtly works. Because they know it's so clear that it's not of works. But eternal life is a free gift. Now, free gift is redundant. I know because a gift is free by its very definition. But he wants you to know. Salvation cost Jesus. Your salvation cost Jesus. Just because it didn't cost you doesn't mean it's cheap. Okay? Just that you didn't pay for it. You couldn't. That's how much he loved you. You couldn't. You couldn't pay for it if you wanted to. Couldn't. He loved us enough to die for us so we could have immortality and live with him forever. Now, we're going to have a glorified body because who he justified, he also glorified. We're to reckon this flesh dead. We're to walk with the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to be a light to the world. So if we're not doing that, I mean, we're kind of wasting. I mean, what are we doing? You know, but none of that is saving any of us. And I wanted you to see, of course, it pays for willful sin. It's very, most sin is on purpose. Like he listed all that stuff, lying to your neighbor, stealing, adultery, all this stuff. That's what those sacrifices were for. It just shows you we're, we're in the, we're born in this carnal flesh. Paul said, I am carnal, sold under sin, meaning not that he was a carnal Christian, but that he lived in flesh. He was carnal in the sense that he was temporal, earthly, and made out of fallen flesh. And although he wanted to do the things that please God, he found himself failing over and over again because it warred against him. But when we keep our eyes on Jesus, it just, it gets easier because you're not thinking about you and your your flesh and your sin and this condemnation all the time you're walking in joy and peace so you can focus on other things you can, you know god loves you you know where you're going uh, when you leave this body absent from the body and present with the lord what a great thing to know so i hope you can see this whole because that you know that's an argument they go well, yeah, he paid for your sin, except for willful sin, because if you willfully sin, what, you you sent away the blood of Jesus? Do you think that's what that means? No, no. It was a very specific willful sin of rejecting um, the efficiency of the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus. We just can't do that. It's so important. And I'm trying to do everything I can for all the ridiculous arguments that come up against the rest we have in Christ, knowing our our blessed assurance, any argument that that keeps getting through, I, I'll try to explain it and I'll refute it in the scriptures. But we see there are Old Testament sacrifices for intentional sin. Of course there are. Okay, you guys, uh, man, I really love you guys. I'm 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 not as at peace when I don't get to see you guys and fellowship with you that much. So I'm trying to make an effort to do that, but we uh, still have a lot going on. Still have a lot going on. And poor Jim Jim has a fever. I think he's got strep throat. He gets it like every year. So um, they want to take his tonsils out, but we've been putting it off, hoping that it would go away, you know, after a while. He did good last year, I think, but he did have it once. Anyway, uh, keep him in prayer and us in prayer, if you don't mind. Um... And uh, pray, pray for my strength, pray for my peace that I, you know, lean on the Lord and, and don't, you know, it's things have been hard. So just pray for my strength, you know, um, and pray for each other. God bless you guys. Night.